Vanimo Green MP recommended for dismissal. Prema negotiates for head of beheaded teacher. And Prime Minister assesses school damage. This is the National MTV News with Mary Bartulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Monday's news. Vanimo Green River MP Belda Nama has been recommended for dismissal from public office. This is after the Supreme Court found him guilty on seven counts of misconduct in office. These include interference with administrative processes and improper conduct and abuse of power. These charges stemming from when Nama stormed into the courthouse in 2012 and demanded the arrest of Chief Justice Sir Salamo Injia. Nama was present in court when the decision was handed down this morning. The Leadership Tribunal consisted of a three-man bench, including National Court Judge Justice Terence Higgins, Senior Principal Magistrate Patricia Tivese, and Senior Magistrate Alex Kaladin. The verdict, stated in a 39-page judgment, outlines the allegations against the Vanimo Green River MP. This court case dates back to 2012, when Mr. Nama entered the courtroom at Waigani and demanded the arrest of the Chief Justice. The other counts include the failure to provide annual statements and his interference with administrative process in the suspension of the district administrator. Nama has been fined a sum of 4,250 kina for the six counts and recommended for dismissal on the seventh count. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Member for Medang Brian Kramer has met with the community at Bao, where a primary school teacher was beheaded. He has given them three days to bring back the head of the teacher killed. The teacher was beheaded last Monday, and his relatives are demanding the killers return his head. Kramer told locals he is concerned about the families of the men killed following violence on Saturday morning that is still continuing. Police will be open fire. At 4 p.m. yesterday, Medeng MP Brian Kramer drove up to the Bao community to meet with the community leaders and the community to assess the situation firsthand. He talked to the community members and has also asked them to locate the missing head of the teacher killed and return it to his family for proper burial. So, we must this <laughs> so because our family come down, I uh, all like see body go, now uh, on up head go, carry go, and this is something I'm going uh, something bump now, uh, something go west. Community members asked Krema to assist them to clear the road so that they can also be able to have access into town to buy their necessities, saying they will also not be able to travel to and from town in fear of their lives after the other faction who claim to be relatives of the teacher attacked them. They also asked that the Bao Vocational Center to open so that students can attend classes and the member has agreed to look into the problem. <laughs> Meanwhile, three people are confirmed dead while four people are injured, including a policeman who is in a critical but stable condition. Two of the youths are admitted at Yagam Health Clinic, while the other one is admitted at the Modilon Hospital. Krema has also visited the policemen and the three other locals injured at Modilon Hospital and Yagam Health Clinic. Masa Luis, National MTV News, Medang. And the situation in Medang remains tense. Police fired multiple shots to disperse more than 3,000 people after youth pelted police and tried to breach their lines at Gum Bridge. Police are maintaining a strong presence in the area. Again, Martha Lewis reports. Tensions remain high in Medang after police fired shots early this afternoon to disperse protesters who were demanding the removal of illegal settlements in the town. Medang police, backed by two mobile squad sections from Lay, opened fire after protesters pelted police with stones. The crowd withdrew after swords were fired, but as they left, they cut down trees, blocking the highway once again. 
Meeting MP Brian Kramer was in negotiation with the protesters who are predominantly from the local communities. They have demanded immediate action from the Medang provincial government to issue immediate eviction orders to settlers who have been blamed for ongoing crime and harassment in town. Meanwhile, the Medang Hospital has issued a notice saying it was scaling down operations due to the water shortage caused after vandals destroyed water supply equipment on Saturday night. Police are continuing to maintain a heavy presence at Goom Bridge. Martha Louise, National MTV News, Medang. Representatives of the national government and autonomous Bougainville government met in Port Mosby today, agreeing on a range of issues to advance the implementation of the Bougainville Peace Agreement. The meeting between a national government chief secretary, Isaac Lupari, and ABG chief secretary, Joseph Nobetau. Among issues discussed were the members and funding arrangement for the Bougainville Referendum Commission, the second joint autonomy review, as well as the progress of the four-phase weapons disposal plan. The meeting also discussed critical referendum issues including finalizing the questions to be put and criteria to apply in the referendum. Both leaders also resolved to hold the next joint meeting of technical officials in Buka on the 27th of this month with the joint supervisory body confirmed for the week beginning May 14th. Here with National MTV News, we'll have more of the day's top stories when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Yalibu Pangia MP and Prime Minister Peter O'Neill wants an interim school principal for Yalibu Secondary School. In his visit to the school over the weekend, Mr. O'Neill told local communities that the academic year must continue. Investigations into the school fight and death of a student are progressing. Ten days after a fight broke out at Yalibu Secondary School, resulting in classrooms torched and a student killed. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill paid his visit to the school. PM O'Neill walked through the school campus to see the scale of damage done. Following the visit, the Prime Minister spoke to the local community. His message and interim school principal must be appointed. MP, uh, Provincial Education Board, I'm uh, decision blown, but you may wait him decision blown now. Uh, I think we may learn to the principal, Mr. Balchard, the click now. 18 principal take over. A local businessman also wanted a representative from a church to chair the school's board. He says the community wants no interruption of classes. Mission agency or someone like Pater or Kain Santin must come stop now. Control him on the Santina so that people get up and must be neutral body must stop. The fight happened almost two weeks ago following an argument over the school principal position. An investigation into the fight and cost suffered is progressing. This school must not going to go two or three more weeks. It must start next week. Huh? Mm. Jack LaPava, Jr., National MTV News. The people of Kokop Village in the Hagen Central Electorate of Western Highlands Province have received electricity for the first time after 40 years. Village councillor John Penner and his tribesmen held a small gathering last Friday and invited media personnel to pass on their appreciation. This is one of the four projects for Hagen Central's rural electrification program. The electricity project will benefit more than 9,000 people in four council wards at the Kokop area. Despite living in the Hagen Open Electorate, which is just a 15-minute drive out of the city, they have not received much basic services for a long time. They live on the borders of the Mulbay Electorate and Tambul Nebilia. This rural electrification project costs 1.2 million kina. <laughs> Communism is going to look sound on this world something. Now, Minister, I've been coming here. I've been coming and giving people all good service. 
The Rural Electrification Project is one of Hagen Open MP William Dumas' plans to ensure his people receive services to raise their standard of living. Six million kina was made available for the project in his electorate. So far, 12 areas in the electorate have already received electricity. The power project at Kokop Village was funded through a local association called Kimuka Farmers and Developers Association. Founded in 2014, the association tries to subsidize transport costs for local farmers to sell their fresh produce. PNG Power has connected power poles and service lines to at least 7-kilometer road and there are already some houses that are using electricity. The rest of the residents are still waiting for PNG Power Limited to complete the unfinished work. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Simbu province will soon establish a new fire service office in Kundiawa. Simbu Governor Michael Dua says this is important as the town continues to grow and with fire an issue throughout the country. This follows the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the Simbu provincial government and the PNG fire service. The Timbu Provincial Government has seen the need for a fire service to be established in the Kundiawa Township. Governor Dua says a fire service office is needed as both the public and private sector are seeing an increase in business activities. He says safety must be guaranteed for all who invest in Simbu. In order to safeguard all those uh, properties, you know, we need to have this fire service in place. So. I was signing with the fire service, uh, covering the fire service department. It's very timely. Uh, it's very important for the province. We cannot say it's a small province. It's forever uh, developing. Governor Dua officially signed the MOU with Chief Fire Officer Bill Rue at the fire service headquarters in Port Mosby. The fire service says provinces need to partner with the department to expand its services. For Simbu, there has been no fire service in the past 35 years. It's not only about fire, it's about any emergency work. It means the postal highway, any accidents that happen, these are the first people that will be there to secure. So, as fire come up, or oil spillage, or anything that is happening, any emergency that is happening, these are the first people that will be intervening to save lives. According to the Simbu governor, there is land for the office to be established. He says the provincial government will invest fair funding in its 2018 budget. We look for vehicles for them. Even if it means we put them on the budget, we'll put them on the provincial budget too. For the sustainability and the operations belong all the province. So one time this is me too happy long all the local MPs plan blah. Me plus six plan pieces that all two can step in. Help me because you know. All people will meet us so them, all people will become the one one district belong all two, so at this time last back said na help makes us meet uh, it becomes a reality in the province. There are fourteen established fire service centers throughout the country. Simbu will be the fifteenth. Jack Lapave Jr. National M T V News. Meanwhile, Simbu Governor Michael Dua urged the general public in Simbu not to stir up violence with most of the election court cases progressing. Dua says the court will decide and not the people. Governor Dua is in court with former Governor Noah Kuhl. The election petition case will be heard this Friday at the Waigani National Court. So, this is the case of the people who people who it's not about everybody, it's about few people. And people are trying to have a personal interest for people, but they have not come up. Because I appeal to all people from the people of Simbu, good blood thinking must stop. Free eye surgeries for cataract patients in Lay began over the weekend with a total of around 60 patients expected to be operated on. The surgeries are being conducted and funded by the Lila Foundation in partnership with the Pacific and Lay International Hospitals. Lila Foundation Director Amina Sultan says more than 100 cataract or patients with clouded vision were identified in Lay with 60 of them registered for surgery.
These patients are waiting to have their eyes screened before they can have surgery. The Lila Foundation, an NGO, is conducting these surgeries with the Pacific and Lay International Hospitals. So that we can reach out uh, to these uh, people, uh, patients who have cataracts, which is a cloudy lens uh, in both eyes. And they have been delivering eye care programs in the country since 1995. Among patients who came on Saturday was a 49-year-old vocational school teacher from Makam. He has been suffering from an eye condition for the past eight years. Due to his condition, he was forced to leave work. Time he panis pa heavy, mo sa road pa lokal to my family, mi had to panis school fees na sign mo papa or cancel. During the screening process, however, they found that he needed retina surgery because his eyes had been bleeding. So this is not a cataract. Cataract surgery will not bring your vision back you would require retina surgery. Despite not having surgery, he was thankful that he got advice about his condition. He was given a referral to the Enga Hospital. In light of Logan's case, Dr. Sultan said there is still a need for more awareness. Please go and see the eye care nurse or the eye doctors early so that if you require surgery or other treatment that can be instituted in time. Godfrey Englishu is in his 60s. He started losing his sight two years ago. He came to the hospital wanting to restore his sight. He qualified to have the surgery done and is waiting. At 3.30 p.m., Godfrey was called into the theatre and prepared for surgery. With Godfrey now settled in, the surgery starts. With Godfrey now settled in, the surgery starts. His right eye was cut and the damaged tissue causing cloudy vision was removed. With precision, a plastic lens was inserted into his eyes. This will enable him to see clearly again. His right eye was dressed and he was good to go. <laughs> Reports by the National Prevention of Blindness Committee state that PNG has high rates of avoidable blindness. Dr. Sultan says due to the need, these visits are likely to be made monthly. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. And the cataract eye surgery is conducted by Laila Foundation in partnership with the Pacific and Lee International Hospitals ended this afternoon. 60 patients were screened and 35 were operated over the weekend. There will be another visit next month with the dates yet to be confirmed. With the private sector, the dominant sector in driving nation economies, there is a need to have the sector partner with government agencies in dealing with climate change. The Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, in partnership with USAID, is hosting a workshop to bring together the public and private sectors to partner in climate change initiatives. The workshop also aims to strengthen country bids to access funding from the Green Climate Fund. With the impacts of climate change being experienced firsthand in Papua New Guinea, moves are now being made to ensure that the country benefits from opportunities to help deal with climate change issues. The Office of Climate Change and Development Authority, CCDA, is PNG's National Designated Authority, or NDA, in dealing with climate change issues. Today, a workshop was held to bring together the CCDA with various other stakeholders within the climate change space to learn more about the Green Climate Fund or GCF. According to the CCDA, although progress has been somewhat slow, there is optimism for the future, especially as the CCDA looks to partner with private sector to draw down funding from the GCF for climate change programs in the country. So what that means is the Green Climate Fund has approved a funding of about 1.5 million kina which will help us in terms of uh, strengthening our institutional capacity, uh, strengthening private sector engagement and, um, uh, and uh, stakeholder engagement. The moves taken by CCDA to partner with the private sector is seen as the way to go, especially given that the private sector has traditionally been innovative in their approach in dealing with climate change. According to Lee Baker from the Climate Ready Project, their objective is to support government agencies through various partnerships, something which they say PNG should look towards. 
The objective of the Climate Ready Project is, is to support governments and private sector access climate financing. And there, there's two ways to do that. One is through the direct access that Roel mentioned, that uh, PNG is currently pursuing through CCDA as the national designated authority. The other is through partnering with, with other accredited agencies that already have access to the Green Climate Fund, like UNDP, uh, World Bank, uh, ADB. I know that uh, PNG is working with UNDP on putting together an early warning system uh, project for uh, GCF. So I think PNG will catch up quickly, and certainly with uh, CCDA, we'll be getting accreditation in the not too distant future. The workshop today brought together representatives from various Pacific Island countries to discuss about the Green Climate Fund. And with the backing of USAID, the initial results look promising with USAID keen to continue its role in facilitating climate change initiatives for the Pacific and more so for Papua New Guinea. We believe strongly in local empowerment and we believe in uh, local partnerships and accountability. And here we're adding something else which I think is important and that is the partnership of the private sector. We cannot do it alone. And so when we work on these issues, we have local and strong partnership. We have the private sector and we as facilitators of this process of course are happy to engage with all of you to leverage resources. Over 100 participants at Bomana Correctional Services turned up to register for classes at the Human Development Institute campus that officially opened this morning at Bomana CS. This is following an MOU signed last month with HDI to set up a campus at Bomana in dealing with programs on rehabilitation. The first level of training will run for three weeks where individuals will learn to make a positive contribution to the world in which they live in. Founder of HDI, Sam Tam, told the participants that if they change the way they think, they can do anything. HDI trains individuals for a successful business life and is an alternative education system. The Human Development Institute has registered over 100 students at their campus at the Bomana Correctional Services. This morning, inmates, correctional service officers, and their family members turned up to register for the first level of training conducted by HDI. And first time, we will, uh, you got one blah agreement on them, uh, Bomana Correctional Institution. Long Halipi Moli Line Long Kalabus. Long walk him, walk long only so that you know time only be this long here at least only got life, you got future long only. By me school him only how to look out in family long only, how to come up in Lily income Lily. The correctional services cannot meet all requirements in terms of resources, and that is where HDI will come in with its resources. This level of training of personal viability is created to train an individual to make a positive contribution to the world in which they live. After three weeks theory, you in the classroom. After that, level two, level three, you know what theory now? You may go outside and walk, you walk, you use him, sabe? Only one thing, only projects, only income generating projects. have told us over, you use him, sabe? Manager Administrator Superintendent Yeli Oyufa said all those attending the classes will be exempted from duty. Prisoners who go down to low security areas will be the ones who will be attached. It's an environment that we have the appreciation because it tends to help the prisoners after they leave or they are being discharged from our custody and are released back to the community. They need sort of rehabilitate, rehabilitate their mindset to mindset so that they be able to feed back into the community. In addressing the participants, founder Tam said HDI is not a school to gain more knowledge about business, but it is an institute to use the knowledge one already has to build a successful business. Business is not about money, business is about people. The programs offered by HDI have helped over 35,000 Papua New Guineans create rewarding careers and lives. Lillian Soperakinea, National, MTV News. 
Employees of the National Weather Service have again taken a nationwide industrial action to stop work. This comes after the outstanding salaries grievances were not addressed since they raised the matter in December 2017. Services which are affected include daily weather reports for both the traveling public and the airline and shipping industries. The employees had presented a petition to Secretary for Transport on March the 16th and were told 1.7 million kina was allocated by the Department of Treasury to address this. However, that has not eventuated. The 68 workers commenced their stop work last Friday and are awaiting a response from the Transport Department once again. You're with National MTV News. Stories making headlines when we come back after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. A family in Port Moresby is now homeless after they were forcefully evicted last Friday by a group of police officers. Family members are now calling for authorities to help them fight for their home and title of land. A fenced wall has already been established, keeping the family out of the block of land which they have lived for the past 35 years. They say no proper eviction notices or legal documents were presented to them. They have also condemned the approach by police officers carrying out the eviction. All kerap kati mol banana number number puti go down buruk mouse go down all kerap all toke mi plus go na go na rosy or something hari apari ap mi plus sadla rosy or something now na mi plus tintin mi plus by go lower all picking in one time all moving mol something go come go come now em mi plus carry mol kerap kam puti lo here. On 6th April, police officers from various divisions within the city forcefully evicted the family. According to the family members, the land was bought by a Motuan woman from NHC offices. It's a similar trend for many evicted families whose stories MTV has exposed despite the government putting a stop to all evictions on NHC properties. We got six the family has written letters to Northwest MP Sam Mekere Morauta, NCD Governor Powers Pakop, Department of Lands, and Mosby South MP Justin Chichenko. They also want NHC to explain the process of title transfer and compensation for damages to the properties. A neighbor says the treatment is inhuman. I'm rain been punda na no gara plol ba stop house to no gat so all come no stop backside lo this la yard. Jack Lepave Jr. National MTV News. Turning abroad now, many travelers look to the Philippines' tropical island of Boroque as a beautiful place for a holiday. But now the Philippines government is calling it a cesspool and closing the popular destination so it can get cleaned up. They come for the sun, surf, white sandy beaches, seemingly clear blue water and spectacular nightlife. This is Boracay, a central Panay island on the northern tip of the Philippines, a top destination for local and foreign tourists. Its lively night scene and abundant water sports attracted nearly 2 million visitors last year. Boracay has been in an abusive relationship with humans. This year, government officials say the islands become overrun with trash and has a wastewater problem. Long-term residents claim algae bloom recurs annually in Boracay Island. However, the seasonal blooms along the white sandy beaches have not gone away. Its abundance is also attributed to legal dumping of wastewater into the sea. Over the past several years, the storm drains have been clogged up by the wastewater, worsening the flooding in the islands during the rainy season and contributing to water pollution. Workers on the island appealed for aid on Sunday after President Rodrigo Duterte's announced closure of the holiday island. The Philippine government plans to demolish illegally built structures in protected areas such as wetlands and forests and crack down on hotels and business houses that do not have proper sewage systems. Wetlands will be rehabilitated. Illegal structures, piled up debris, sediments and invasive alien species 
will be removed from these life-giving areas. The forest will be recovered and properly taken care of. President Duterte has ordered a closure of the island for six months starting April 26th this year. The president has also approved plans to ban tourists in those six months, paving the way for cleanup operations for what he had described as a cesspool. It will take longer than six months to rehabilitate and sustain and save Boracay, but this is a good start because the major works that have to be done have to be done unhampered without the uh, presence of too many people on the island. Paradise on the island of Borkai may be lost for now, but the promise is that Borkai will look better by next high season six months from now. Helen Sea, MTV World News. To the Middle East now, and Israeli forces and Palestinian protesters have clashed for the second straight weekend over Israel's blockade along the border. There's no question the border between Israel and Gaza remains tense after a second Friday of widespread protests along the security fence. Sunday afternoon, the Israeli military fired across the border after they say three Palestinians crossed the fence into Israel, then crossed back into Gaza. And that gives you an idea of how sensitive the border area is right now. The most talked about story throughout the weekend has been the killing of Palestinian journalist Yasser Murtaja. Murtaja was wearing his press vest when he was shot and killed by Israeli forces on Friday, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health. Hundreds attended his funeral, including the head of Hamas in Gaza. Murtaja's death and eight others killed on Friday has amplified a chorus of international criticism against Israel, accusing Israel of using disproportionate and indiscriminate force against Palestinian protesters in Gaza. Reporters Without Borders, an international media watchdog, said it's clear that Israel fired intentionally at Murtaja. In response to CNN, the Israeli military said it does not intentionally target journalists. The military said, quote, the circumstances in which journalists were allegedly hit by IDF fire are not familiar to the IDF and are being looked into. Israel, meanwhile, holds Hamas responsible for orchestrating the violence along the Gaza border. Israeli officials have said those who were shot were attempting to carry out attacks or breach the security fence. Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman said there were no innocent civilians. He called the demonstrations a terror parade. Since the widespread demonstrations began at the end of March, 31 Gazans have been killed by IDF forces, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health. Hundreds more have been injured by live fire. PLO official Hanan Ashrawi slammed Israel's use of live fire in response to widespread Gaza protests, calling for an international investigation into Israel's actions. Obviously, the situation remains very fluid now, but already we're expecting more protests this coming Friday. And that's true for every Friday from now until mid-May. Even if the numbers were down from the previous week, each of these protests still has the potential to spark a much bigger conflict. You're watching National MTV News. We go for a break now. When we come back, some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Truka Sports. We begin with some updates from the Commonwealth Games and in weightlifting, Stephen Curry defended his gold in stunning fashion at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Curry's total lift was 370 kilograms, one kilogram ahead of his Canadian opponent. Here are the highlights. For a gold medal. Champions! 
pulled it out of the bag when it mattered. Incredible lifting. And this is the moment that Paul Corfer has 100 medals. <laughs> There's Paul a coach. Brilliant. That is just extraordinary. $150,000 to well, the And congratulations again to Stephen Curry Tink on Papua New Guinea's first gold medal at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Moving on, Jackie Cooper, a retired Australian freestyle skier and motivational speaker, will be the guest speaker at this year's SP Sports Awards. Cooper is a former Olympian and world champion and is looking forward to speaking at this year's Sports Awards. I can't wait to be your special guest at the Papua New Guinea Sports Awards. I've been to Papua New Guinea three times before. This will be my fourth visit. I'm just as excited about this trip as all of my others. I can't wait to see you soon. To football now, Vice Minister for Sports Wesley Raminai has expressed grave concerns about Oceania Football Confederation President David Chung's resignation from the region's top post. The action has now received widespread media coverage with claims that he was forced to take that action due to some corrupt dealings. In a press statement, the Vice Sports Minister said while Chung is required to be given the benefit of the natural course of justice, the bad, bad publicity is not good for PNG. Raminai has called on Chung to step aside as president of the PNG Football Association and concentrate on proving his innocence on the allegations that have been leveled against him. And on a related note, the Ocean Air Football Confederation Executive Committee met in Auckland over the weekend with several topics of discussion, including the resignation of OFC President David Chung. As a result of its deliberations, the OFC Executive Committee came up with several decisions on the matter. Until the OFC Congress in June 2018, no interim OFC president will be appointed. The OFC will be led by the entire executive committee until an election for the position of president is held in June. The elected member will serve out the current term of OFC president, which concludes in 2019. The report resulting from an audit into the OFC home of football construction process conducted by an external audit firm on behalf of FIFA was analyzed by OFC Executive Committee. In light of the report findings, the OFC Executive Committee has appointed an external lawyer to lead an internal investigation into potential wrongdoings and, take, and to take legal action if required. A forensic audit has been ordered to review in detail the process taken in relation to the OFC home of football and the financial process adopted by OFC administration in past years. The OFC Executive Committee has pledged to cooperate with all relevant authorities throughout this process. In order to address the suspension of funding from FIFA to OFC, the OFC Executive Committee has agreed to implement all the conditions set out by FIFA Audit and Compliance Committee as soon as possible. OFC will set up a reform committee to review the current OFC constitution, policy and practice activity. This committee will be formalized at the OFC Congress in June. In the meantime, the OFC Executive Committee and General Secretariat will remain in regular contact with FIFA over the coming months with the international governing body to provide support and assistance throughout this period. As the various investigations are ongoing, the OFC Executive Committee will not make the OFC Executive Committee will not be making any further comment on this matter at this stage. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. We we'll go for a break now and be back with more of Trukai Sports after these messages. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To Rugby Union now, and after competing at the HSBC Hong Kong Sevens, the Puk Puks are now gearing up for the Commonwealth Games. The Puk Puks, though not making it past the pool stage in Hong Kong, were able to put up a good fight in their three matches. An effort from Arthur Clement and a conversion gives... The PNG Puk Puks secured the first win at the Hong Kong HSBC Seven Series after defeating hosts 22-21. Puk Puk's led 10-5 at half-time, but Hong Kong came back strong in the second half, taking off to a comfortable lead. Inches short of the try line, he might not get there, but might... With one converted try the difference, PNG fought till the last final minute. is a solo try from Arthur Clement, sealed the victory for the Puk Puk's. They are going to 
get a score here with a simple conversion into the hands there of Arthur Clements. They played Zimbabwe in their second match and were urged out 10 points to 17. Puk Puk's trailed by two points at half time. In the second half, Zimbabwe scored early, but PNG fought back with a try to again trail by two points. With 10 seconds left, the Zimbabweans went in to score, securing their win. Offloads to Tambuera. The last match was against the finalists, Germany. A spirited PNG side went down fighting 36 points to 7. Germany scored five tries to lead 29 nil at half time. PNG's second half performance was better than their first as they managed to score a try through Gairo Kapana. Their defensive efforts was better in the second half as they stopped the Germans' attack. The Puk Puks will now compete at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. Large Levet, National MTV Sports. To Formula One now, it has been a dream start for the new season for Germany's four-time world champion Sebastian Vettel. After winning in Australia last month, he made a back-to-back -back win in Bahrain on Sunday. This was a race to forget though for Red Bull. Not for one, but for both of their drivers. They had a shocker early on when um, Daniel Ricciardo had engine failure, followed by Max Verstappen, the young Dutchman with a punctured tyre and had to drop out by the fifth lap there. Kimi Raikkonen retired from third place after a botched pit stop in which a Ferrari mechanic was injured and needed a hospital treatment via Twitter. Ferrari providing an update on him saying it was an apparent shin bone and fibula fracture and that the entire team wishes him well in recovery. And another interesting storyline in Bahrain, Lewis Hamilton, the defending overall driver's champion, was forced to start the race from ninth place due to his Mercedes team having to install a new gearbox on Friday, but a really superb moment for him in which he passed three cars in one move. He would work his way back for a third place finish. Really impressive stuff there for the Brit. But it would be the German, uh, Vettel, who held off a uh, charging Valtteri Bottas, the Ferrari team using a one-stop strategy midway through the race as uh, they thought it was the only chance for the win. It proved to be the right call as well. The four-time champion crossing the line on his ailing tyres and he celebrates. It's been a superb start for Sebastian Vettel. Back-to-back -back wins. And that's all for Trukai Sports. We go for a break. When we come back, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Trukai Sports. <laughs> True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Forecast for tonight and tomorrow, we begin in the southern region, Port Mosby, mostly fine with a chance of evening shower or two. Some showers expected in Daru and Kerama. Afternoon showers for Alotau, a few showers for Popendeta. To the Momasi region, rain expected in Leh and Wau, a few showers for Medang, a shower or two for Wewak and Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine for Lorangao. A few afternoon showers expected for Kaveng and Kimbe. A shower or two for Rabaul, Kokopo and Buka. And a look at the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundia, Mendi and Wabeg. All these major centres can expect fog clearing with a few showers over the next 24 hours. I look at the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours, but first there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island to Western and Eastern Milan Bay Islands, including Madang, West New Britain, Vityas and Torres Straits. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island and with waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen and waters of New Britain to New Island and Bougainville sees 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Eastern and Western Mill Bay Island sees 2 to 3 meters. Waters of Finchhafen through Vityas and Dampier Strait to CSA Island to Long Island sees 2 to 2.5 meters. And waters of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Wiwak, Aitape, Vanimo to the northern PNG Indonesian border. And with waters of Manus in its western group of islands sees 0.5 to 1.5 meters.
and a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas. Coral Sea is moderate to rough with southwesterly winds at 25 to 34 knots. Solomon Sea is moderate to rough with west to northwesterly winds at 20 to 30 knots. Bismarck Sea is slight to moderate with northwesterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. And the Pacific Ocean Sea is slight to moderate with northeast to northwesterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that has been the news, sport and weather for today, Monday the 9th of April 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.